Yo, what's up everyone? Colby Cheese here, and I'm back again for yet another uh, presentation, YouTubified, from one a little bit a while back that I did, and this one is on cleaning shit up. I talk about refactoring, structuring your code, and overall just making everyone's lives easier when working together. So, uh, just for anyone watching, if you need some of the references or extra links, I have them in the slides, which will be linked down below. But let's get started. So, um, if you ask a lot of developers what the best way to write something as trivial as variable names is, what do you get? Uh, are they going to say camel case or snake case? Or perhaps they're going to say dashes? Well, based on an actual survey, um, it's kind of all over the board. Nobody really has any kind of agreement. And that's a little bit troubling, don't you think? Now the thing about this is, you can just go ahead and start writing in your preferred style, but the problem there is that one person's happiness is not the team's happiness. And so you have to really think about how to get along together as a team, and there's, uh, there's a lot to be said about that. So just like with visual design, code also should have a style guide as well. And there are those. And so if you're not already, please, please take a look at some of the JavaScript standards. You can take a look at uh, the links here. There's also becoming more and more popular uh, the use of the Airbnb style guide. They also have one for React. There's a great website that gives you some good style guide, uh, some good guidelines to writing SAS as well. So overall, those guidelines are out there. The only thing you have to do now is get your whole team to align around those. And the great thing about this is when you adopt something that has this over-encompassing set of rules, it may have a few things that you disagree with while you agree with other things and vice versa for your other teammates. But as long as everyone's like, you know what, it's fine, we'll stick to this set of rules that can be consistent across projects, then everyone's lives are across the board going to be better. And so preventing ugly code is sometimes a little bit easier than cleaning it up. But how do you prevent that in the very beginning stages? Well, you just want to automate all the things. So rather than just saying, hey, let's adopt this code standard. Well, why don't you just automate it and make it less that someone has to think about. So you have something like ESLint, or you can set up continuous integration. Uh, so linting is a tool that you can set up in your build process that prevents somebody from pushing uh, code reviews or you know pull requests when code doesn't pass a set of rules. And you can have it installed within your editor so that as you're typing, it's telling you if you're doing something incorrectly. And then you can also set up an editor config for basic things like tabs versus spaces and things like adding an extra space at the end and cleaning up you know, hidden white space. And whenever you have these things tied together with continuous integration and testing systems, you can uh, basically have all of this stuff just taken care of automatically for you. And when all else fails, you still have your code reviews where you can take a look at each other's code. And when you combine all of these things, that right there really does eliminate a lot of nastiness that you can find with inconsistent code between your teams. So the other thing that you might find that really starts to mess with projects as they grow is an inconsistent uh, naming pattern for the actual folders and the files. And this can be a big deal. So I'm giving you an example here of something from the SAS guidelines where they actually give you the um, recommended folders that you would put your files in. And so you're gonna have like a base for like global styles, a components directory, layout, pages for each individual pages. Uh, and then you go all the way down to like your main SAS file that imports everything in. So you have that clean entry point. And the same thing can be done with your JavaScript, with your views. 
And if any of you guys have ever done any code in Ruby on Rails, you'll know that it's a very opinionated framework that actually kind of enforces you to use a consistent naming standard. Um, in the Meteor community, there's this emerging thing called Mantra, which is a similar vein. It's telling you where to put your files. And so it doesn't really matter what you do as long as you decide on something and you stick to it. It's all about consistency. And so it's kind of funny, if you ask any programmer that has inherited somebody else's code base, they're always gonna tell you this code is a big hairy mess. And let me tell you that uh, you pretty much want to rewrite everything that you see a lot of times when you see these crazy monumental code bases, but you can't really do that. Unfortunately, as fun as it is, it doesn't make business sense. So instead of refactoring, or sorry, instead of rewriting bad code, you have to refactor it. So how do you deal with such a monumental task? How do you actually begin refactoring code and making it much more readable and easier to follow along? Well, as they say, one bite at a time. That's how you eat an elephant. All right, let's go ahead and talk about some clean code and project architecture principles. And this is going to get more into how you think while you're writing your code. And it will play into how you begin to refactor bad code as well as writing new blocks of code. So there's a couple of principles. You may have heard this one. Now, there's this whole thing and a whole book around this idea of solid. I'm just gonna talk about the S in solid, which is a single responsibility principle, and that is that a class should have only a single responsibility. So let's take a look at what that means. The idea is that you don't wanna create this God class, the class that does all the things. Instead, so, well, let's take a look at an example here. So this is, uh, this is an example of a God class here. You've got class, person, and the two methods within there are that it will validate the email and then it will do a greeting. So take a look at that for a second and tell me like, what is it that is in here that is too much? And if you answered validate email, well, that's pretty much correct because a person has nothing to do with an email. They may have an email. So instead we should have a class email which validates itself. And then you should have a class person which can have an email. So he has an actual property of email which you then pass in the email class. So that's just an example of breaking up a God class into something further. Everything should be focusing on doing one singular task. All right, now this is the current state of a project that I inherited. This is real code from a real project on the Blue Mix. Uh, cloud platform and it's about a thousand plus lines of code it does everything on the page where you want to create a virtual server so pretty crazy uh, lots of J jQuery everything's touching everything and it can get quite complex now this is what the actual page looks like visually and this is actually after a little bit of a redesign now how might you break this particular page up into multiple components instead of that one thousand line uh, set of jQuery mess that you just witnessed. Well, for starters, let's just take a look at one piece. Well, you've got this little section here, projected usage. Perhaps that's going to be its own class that it manages, you know, the, the quotas and things like that. And then you can take something like, I don't know, the post creation script. Perhaps that's a set of, uh, you know, a class that, that handles just setting up a script and then you've got this create button now there's obviously going to be a lot of logic that goes into a create button in terms of like you need to make sure that everything is passed in from all of the fields right so that's going to be a class so just thinking about all the different pieces and all the different functionality that's going to be needed in your app is going to be important and just think about this conceptually and that's going to help you when you actually start to write your code or to refactor it all right so this is what the code looks like, and it still has a lot of work to go, but what I decided to do as a very like beginning step with that 1,000 lines is I just decided to look for all the little pieces that 
kind of had similar functionality and I broke them into their own class. So rather than a thousand lines, you're gonna have this piece here where it's saying, you know, when the when the content loads, we're gonna do all the initialization. And I just I just gave every class an init function. Um, right now everything's statically typed and we're not gonna get into the discussion of why you know making everything static could is or isn't bad or good idea, but the idea is that everything at least makes sense. You can see where everything is initialized and then you can jump into the functionality of the specific piece that you need. So the way code goes, you, you, know, you can't make everything perfect. All you can do is move in the right direction and that's what is kind of meant to do here in this particular case. Now, the other principle I wanna talk about is the drive principle. You may have heard this one before, and it's don't repeat yourself. So rather than writing, I will not repeat myself, you know, 10 different times, as if you were Bart Simpson, we're gonna say, while I is less than 10, return, I will not repeat myself. So that's just a, you know, goofy example for you, but uh, a real example would be in the same vein here, in the in the code that I was writing for uh, the Bluemix platform, you've got this cloud selector code that was used all throughout every single bit of code. And I'm not gonna really talk about why this needs to happen. It's a long story, but since it's being used so many different times, what we decided to do was abstract that out into its own little utility class. So I've got this utilities uh, class where I can import things in. And so I've taken the selector there and I've created three different methods here. Active cloud, which gives you the actively selected cloud. And then every input, which gives you every input on the page. And then you've got active input, which will give you the correct input based on which cloud is selected. All right, so if you just compare it from the old one to the new one, the old one is just doing all the selection. The new one, you import in the method you need from the utilities class, and then you just call it uh, with the name of the selector that you want. And what this allows us to do is, if I ever end up changing how the cloud is selected or how an input is selected, then, well, I can do it in one place. All right, so that's just a couple of examples for you there. Now, if you're like me, yesterday's code will always suck. Every time I look back at what I did a week ago, I'm like, shit, I could have done that a lot better. But all you can do is keep on iterating. It's always going to be a mindset of consistent improvement. If you ever heard of the term Kaizen, that's the idea that I always try to live by. So I think that if you keep that in your mind, don't beat yourself up over bad code. Just keep on working on it. Now, this is the... IBM design thinking. It was put together, it was put in place to help teams actually build better products from a design perspective. You've got this loop which signifies that you're always going to be working on it. And that's kind of the idea of what I've been getting at here. So in their case, it's gonna be observe, reflect, and make. But if I were to translate it into code, I think it makes a lot of sense as well. So you've got the loop, observe, reflect, make, so in code speak, that's gonna be, let's get to know best practices. Always be learning new things, kind of like you're doing now, you're watching this talk, and then test new ways of thinking. Try out these ideas that you've been learning and understand why people are doing the things that they are doing. And then try to reflect on things that you have seen in the past. Look back and learn from your mistakes as well as others. Hold retrospectives on the outcomes. If you've been coding on a project for a while, you know, for a month or two months, or you've just completed one long sprint, you should be looking back on how that went and try to think of ways to make it better. And for make, you know, just keep on coding. Things are going to break. You're going to make mistakes. Just make sure that you follow best practices when you remember to, you know, try to keep that in mind and just keep in, keep in mind what you've learned and continue to move forward. And that's the loop. Just keep going, observe, reflect, make. So this is my mantra that I stick by. And this is the quote that I always give everyone. And it's always leave code better than it was when you open it. So anytime I jump into a file and if I'm just making one small little change, if there's like a tiny amount of little refactoring that I could do and a, and a method in the same area, then maybe I'll try to do that. If there's a little bit of, uh, things that I can do to abstract something out or to clean it up, then that's what I'm gonna try and do. You can't, you know, again, going back to the slide where I said you can't rewrite the whole code base, no. But as you're just slowly touching things, 
try to leave it better than when you entered. And that's it, guys. Thank you so much for listening to this entire presentation. It means a lot to me, so make sure if anything comes to mind to give me some feedback. And if you ever see me in person, ask for a high five, I'm all about that, etc. So I uh, will see you around for the next one. And by the way, make sure that you've subscribed to me. Follow me on Twitter at Colby Cheese, that's with a Z. And I'll see you guys around for the next one. Peace out, bros.